name is Greg Morgan, Executive Director here at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. I want to welcome you all here tonight. What a great crowd. So, Mr. Nick Cronman, uh, who is a, a personal friend uh, who I've known since I started here in the harbor uh, seven years plus years ago. He grew up in Santa Monica, a great place to snorkel, fish, surf, and generally fall in love with the sea. After he received his, a bachelor's degree in political science from UCSB, Nick promptly went fishing for 10 years, working his way from passenger vessel deckhand to licensed captain to commercial fisherman who jigged albacore, hook and line, rock cod, and harpoon swordfish. Following his fishing career, Mick worked as a maritime consultant and journalist, publishing over 1,500 stories and earning two national literary awards. As a consultant, he represented several fishing organizations in regulatory and political arenas. He also managed several projects in Santa Barbara Harbor, including design and construction of a fisherman's ice machine, uh, is still in work today, and a new fish hoist, plus a set of fisheries interpretive, fisheries interpretive plaques that line our breakwater right here along the harbor, and that also feature the, the very handsome Michael Cork Monsters, and uh, I know that's uh, is in there. In May 2000, Mick took the job as the, uh, as the City of Santa Barbara's Harbor Operations Manager, which he holds to this day. The job involves oversight of 10 Harbor Patrol officers and one Harbor, uh, Harbor Patrol supervisor. He also manages the operations function of a 1200 slip marina. For several years, Mick has served on the board of directors of the California Harbor Masters and Port Captains Association and has twice been named Statewide Harbor Master of the Year. That is impressive, yes. Thank you. Mick, Mick lives in, in Gleeden with his wife Ginger and their 18-year-old son Cole, and of course he is the author of the book that the Maritime Museum published, From Hooks to Harpoons, so please welcome me in, in, uh, join me in welcoming Mick Ron. Thank you so much, Greg, for the gracious introduction. I see, I, see, I, I am so honored, truly, to be here among uh, such esteemed folks. I see, friend, I see faces I'm very familiar with, faces I'm not so familiar with. I see... Um, Folks who have donated to this book, uh, to you, I say thank you so much. We're really on a great roll. We've sold almost 500, and the demand still keeps going. So thank you so very much for supporting the project. I'd like to focus on a, sort of a different theme tonight. And, and ironically, it's a theme that I only began to come to grips with after I wrote the book. I knew the book was... Um, touched on this theme, but I, I, I really now, standing back from it, it's been you know years since I completed the first draft anyway, um, that I, I want to talk about a theme uh, that uh, I hope you'll enjoy, and it's about technology, but it's really about evolution. But before I get into that, I want to give you a little background on the book itself and how we came, how I came to be standing here today uh, with great honor to be in front of you. In 1999, when I was still in the private sector, the Maritime Museum hired me to write 10,000 words on the history of the Santa Barbara Channel. And in the day, I was eager to chase soft money, and I jumped at it. You know, I looked like, looked like a few months' rent to me. And uh, I, the pay was admittedly modest, but, you know, I was, I was all about the project. And then I realized, what the hell am I going to do? How do I do this? This is crazy. What have I done? And so I thought about it, and um, I had... What I told Nick Welsh at The Independent, I had an epiphanal moment in the shower where my most creative moments seemed to come. And I realized if I broke this into chapters, if I, if I broke it into chapters based on gear types, nets, hook and line, harpooning, diving, and, and trapping, I might be able to handle those chapters as sort of mini books and string them all together uh, into the book that, uh, that we have today. And so I did that. And, um, I like to think that I write relatively lean prose, but the 10,000 words turned out 75,000. And, and, I, and, I, and, 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 and please criticize me. Feel free, to, feel free to criticize me if you see silly run-on sentences in this book. But anyway, um, I took my modest sum of money and went, Jesus, that was a lot of work. And uh, I gave it to the museum, and it, and it basically sat on a shelf for, I want to say, you know, to, a dozen years before Greg, and I, I got to take my hat off to him, his inspiration and direction and leadership of this museum, of this organization and institution, in my view, has been fabulous. It's just, it's, I can see by...
I can see by your reaction that you agree. And it's just been great to see the exhibits change and the creativity and the ingenuity and the vision and inspiration change. This place is really on the map and it's on the map to stay and it's thanks to Greg and his staff. So Greg's the one that had the vision and said, Mick, this is ridiculous. What's this manuscript doing on the shelf gathering dust? Because in fact, I'd had the good fortune when I was researching this book with great assistance from folks like Marla Daly, the, the, uh, the president of the Santa Cruz Island Foundation who allowed me un, unbridled access to her files and archives. Um, I'd had the, the, the great honor of interviewing a whole bunch of fishermen who are no longer with us, okay? Who have so-called crossed the bar and Red Allen and Dario Castagnola and the name and Sam Ferry, the names go on and on. And, uh, and so together, working with Greg and, and, and Dennis Schutt, one of my favorite people on the planet and, and good friend and, and graphic designer, we pulled this thing together and last October we rolled it out at the Harbor Festival and, and here we are today and I'm happy to say we've sold about, oh, we're coming up on 500 copies and we're gonna be making another order and, and I think it's really starting to gather steam. But back to the theme, what I'd like to do tonight I'm going to try and integrate a PowerPoint display, which, which isn't huge, it's only the 17 slides. I'm going to try and integrate that with passages from the book on the following theme. And the theme is technology. Of course, the, the chapters are divided into gear types, which, which suggests a technological you know, bent or, 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 or compass heading uh, to start with. But what I realized, the more I thought about this, the more I talked to people, and I relook at this manuscript, now a book, is that um, technology, it's so easy to look at technology and say, well, they went from A to B. But going from A to B, in the technological sense, they went from this machine for doing A to this machine for doing A. It's so easy to not know or to forget all of the variable influences that went into that change the human influences, the political influences, the ecological influences, the, the mechanical influences, the, in, the inventions, the ingenuity, the creativity, the vision, the dreams. And that's what I'm try to, I'll try to touch on tonight during this presentation. And um, with your patience and understanding, if I, the, 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 my only challenge is interfacing the PowerPoint slides with the passages I want to read. Because I don't have a passage for every PowerPoint slide. I pick passages that I think reflect the, you know, the, the intent of the slides. So I beg your forgiveness if I mess that up, but I practice it enough times, hopefully I've got it. So with that, let us begin. So the first chapter is about nets, and, and just as, as a uh, indication of complexity that um, we all wrestle with when trying to write history and understand how things evolve, there are plenty kinds of nets. There are, there are set gill nets, there are drift gill nets, there are trawl nets, and, and there are so many different kinds of nets that one really, I, I'm just going to choose nets in general to try and describe to you some of the evolution of, um, uh, of the net fisheries and, and what some of the challenges uh, were. So um, what we have here is a shot from like the 1940s. Back in the 1940s, it was all about cotton nets. Well, cotton rots, okay? so. You know, what it took to fish with cotton nets was extraordinary compared to today's fishery. So not only did you have to tan the nets and cure the nets and dry the nets, because today's nylon, unlike today's nylon nets, these nets were brittle and hard and because you had to, you had to cure them or else they'd just rot and fall apart in the sea. So these are drying racks. I think it was up in Anacapa uh, Street. Uh, that were laid out, and I have a passage here regarding this that I wanted to read to you to give you an understanding of what it was like as a family affair. It wasn't like today where you go out fishing, you come back, you unload, you go home, you open a cold beer, and you, and you have dinner, and you set your alarm, and you get up and go and do it uh, tomorrow. So this is, um, uh, this is a passage that uh, I, I I got from speaking with Sonny Castagnola about his brother Lawrence Castagnola, a longtime fisherman here who has uh, since passed away. Sonny, and this is on the same page as this, as this appears in the book. All these PowerPoint slides are from the book. Sonny's brother Lawrence, also a lifelong fisherman, spoke of childhood days spent building and curing nets and pulling them by hand. When I was real little, I remember my father tying nets to the doorknob, building them from scratch. 
The kid's job was to keep putting twine on the wooden net needles. To cure the nets, his father soaked them in copper tanks full of boiling water spiked with oak bark, the oak's tannic acid inhibits rot, and then set them on the racks to dry. After they were dry, they needed to be mended and placed in burlap and canvas sacks to prevent them from rotting in the evening dew. This went on constantly. While some nets were fishing, others were being cured. At the time, we didn't mind the work. That's just the way it was. So what does that speak to? It speaks to not only was fishing entirely a family affair, it speaks to a work ethic that some of you may believe, I know I sort of believe it, of a bygone era, um, where it's just what you did. And you'll hear some more passages about it's just what you did. It's, it was work and, and work only, and that's what mattered, and the entire family was involved, and so it also reflects a different family ethic. I mean, think about it in the era of social media and what have you, and, the, and I'm not gonna necessarily you know, describe that as a, a disconnecting of the family unit, but this, this was family in its essence in the, in the fishing community here in the 1930s and 1940s and what have you. So the evolution from this to uh, better technology, technology that would allow fishermen to fish less hours and catch more uh, without having to go through this process and what have you, started as a family, functionally as a family affair. So this is a, a classic example as well. So nets were typically hauled by hand. And um, uh, because they were hauled by hand, it became very difficult to, um, to, to, to do, period. I mean, it was just a very, very difficult uh, undertaking. So one of the greatest breakthroughs in early uh, uh, 19th century uh, fisheries in, in, uh, in California was the invention of what's called the net girdy. So if you look here, you'll see this object right here. And what it was was a means that fishermen employed to haul nets quicker, to be able to haul more nets, to reduce staff, you know, crewmen, and to get fish to market quicker so they could turn around. And this one was purely the invention of fishermen who, moving from the sailing fishing boat era into the gasoline engine powered fishing era, dreamed up themselves. But there's a human element in this I want to share with you that I was touched by when I, when I interviewed Manny Gorgita about this. So the Gurdy head basically is a function of you've got a driving engine and with it now you've got gears, you've got power takeoffs, you've got, you can use that horsepower to drive what they call line shafts with pulleys on them create U-joints, and have something that turns horizontally on the deck. And uh, this, at the time, it looks very unsophisticated. This was in the 1940s, because you can see the, the uh, shark liver pots scattered around the deck where they, uh, where they kept the shark livers. But um, this was a huge, huge breakthrough. And, wh and what I found most interesting about this, and I'm going to read you a passage, um, it has to do with the pride that fishermen took in, the, in, in breaking through with technological breakthroughs like this. Increasingly, during the 1940s, there emerged a need for pulling nets mechanically, not by hand, especially in the shark fishery, where the gear was hauled from great depths. Now think about that. Before invention of the line shafts and the, or you know, application of line shafts and net people, fishermen were pulling nets by hand from three, four, five hundred feet of water. It's, it's just, it's almost inconceivable how much, how much work that took. So, um, fishermen developed the net gurdy to bring nets aboard quickly and, and easily, and ultimately to fish deeper and harder and reduce the number of crewmen needed to haul, uh, like, like, excuse me, haul gear like the Lampara nets. A night, um, with the first girdies, and this is a quote from, from Manny Gorgita, I believe, with the first girdies, uh, we only use them sporadically because they were wore out if, the, if you weren't careful. And then he says, and I find this most prophetic, then he says, still, it was such a new deal, guys took great care in building them correctly. Sugar Linwall, a Santa Barbara boatwright, would help machine the equipment, and guys would cut tires into pieces that fit perfectly together so the net would grip the rubber and come around the gurdy smoothly without hassles or snags. So I'll stop there for a second. Can you imagine 
once you have a net gurney like this and you're hauling faster and cleaner and not ripping the nets and you can reduce your, your crew size, you can call, pull the nets faster, you can get to port quicker. Unbelievable breakthrough, as simple as it seems to be. Now we've got a table that turns horizontally on the deck. This is the part I loved about this, and this really speaks to the sort of fabric of variables that went into uh, all the technological advances in the fishing industry, which I'm sure is, is true of almost any industry if you look at it uh, through that prism. Some fishermen even went to the junkyard for hubcaps to mount on the gurdy to keep the water off and make it look real pretty. <laughs> I mean, think about it. This thing is functionally um, meant to make life easier, make you, make you wealthier, make your business succeed, feed your family, and they went and got hubcaps to make them look shiny. It's like, it's like putting chrome rims on your, on your car. There was a pride that went into something that seems as raw and inhuman as technological advance, and that really stuck with me, and I, I, uh, I wanted to share that with you. The invention of nylon was, was a monstrous breakthrough. Of course, it wasn't invented for fisheries, but, but the, uh, uh, the non-rotting capacity of it, the strength of it, the, the capabilities of nylon changed the, the industry forever uh, to this day. And one of the things it did is it made trawling with large nets uh, like this one uh, possible and, and to the point where you could ha have large catches, have a little bit of not too much mending, and uh, you could be out to see uh, to do it again. And I wanted to read to you uh, a passage regarding um, this um, because it was, um, it, it, and this is, this is from the Santa Barbara Channel, and it's from um, Ralph Hazard, if I can get the right one here. I apologize for that. That was, that's fairly recently, but it's reflective of the 60s and 70s. As rockfish trawling began to rise to prominence in Santa Barbara, names like Ralph Hazard became synonymous with mighty hauls. Bobby Reed remembers fishing with Ralph Hazard. We tow for a couple of hours, right out in the middle of the channel, on the west end of the bank called a f west end of a bank called the Finger. When we hauled up our gear, the bag would be so full we could it would pull the boat backwards. I'm sorry, I got to go past this picture. It would pull the boat backwards. Then all of a sudden, you'd see it, the Pink Mountain, a thirty thousand pound bag of fish so full you couldn't stuff another rock cod in it. It was an incredible sight. Ralph was a notoriously tough fisherman, maybe the toughest Santa Barbara has ever seen, said Reed. He was immune to the pain of cuts, bruises, hard work, or exhaustion. Even, as, even in his 60s, Ralph would outwork any young man. I don't know where he got the, the energy either. Hell, all he'd bring for us to eat was Weber's bread and Swiss cheese and liver sausage and chili con carne. But he could stay awake and fish for three days straight if he had to. So the work ethic hasn't gone anywhere, but the technology has changed, so he's not back at home drying and mending nets, and to have, you know, in his family, though I know Julie and Susan, his daughters, still did some work at home. So this is, the invention of nylon is a monstrous breakthrough that allowed the trawl fisheries to, to emerge and, and to the status they did in the 1960s and 70s. This is one of my favorite shots. This guy's standing on the ocean. Same, same applies to purse sanding. So purse sanding is typically done from, from large booms uh, uh, that's, that, that uh, set a net in, in a huge circle and purse it in. But folks like these guys realize that if you do it from a drum, this is not a monstrous technological breakthrough, but it's a significant one. If you do it from a drum like that, you could retrieve it more quickly. You could get it set it again. It's really just like a giant fishing reel instead of setting it directly off the boat and having to take the boat in a giant circle to physically set the net. Um, High-tech boats like Neil Guglielmo's Triumpho um, typified the Persane fleet. He forewent the power block, which I was just describing, uh, available on her boom, but only used for loading and unloading the net. He forewent that for a six by 12 foot drum, much like a giant fishing reel or gill net reel described early, earlier from which the gear, the, the gear was set and hauled. Drumming, adapted from salmon and herring fisheries, reduced crew from five to three, 
allowed a skipper to only set part of a net if he chose to, and expedited retrieval time. So here we have not really new technology, it's sort of new technology, but they figured that you, they, you could set a purseine net and retrieve a purseine net with fewer crew, more control, and, fa and faster retrieval. So if they miss the fish, they get the net back quicker, they get it in the water quicker, and they have more opportunities to set in a single night. Then came along monofilament gill nets. Now, as part of what I described before as the, the multi-layered fabric of, of technological development, monofilament gill nets changed the, the fishing world completely. Uh, they became popular in the early 1980s for species like this, like coastal halibut. But they, uh, ha they also brought on a devastating political battle. And I want to read to you a passage about that. Here we go. The inshore set net fishery, meanwhile, also went through dramatic changes during the 1980s. Most important was introduction of the monofilament gill net early in the decade. Nearly disposable by nature, they were much lighter and easier to handle than maybe, excuse me, uh, than nylon nets and performed just as well, if not better, catching plenty of fish but fewer sticks and kelp. If hung with a lot of slack, they even made single wall net fisheries for halibut feasible. That's a little longer discussion first about trammel nets that we don't need to go into. Um, and, then, and eliminating the, the need for three wall trammel nets. Some fishermen regret the day mono hit the scene, claiming they, caught, they paved the way for anti uh, gill net voter initiative that would push all but a few Santa Barbara set netters out of the fishery. And this is from Bobby Reed, a quote. I knew the mono nets were bad news the first time I saw them, said Bobby. Overnight, they made fishermen out of guys who had no business fishing, and they pushed marine mammal bycatch issues to the front burner. So what happened was, in the 1980s, when, the, when, monofilament, get, when monofilament line became popular among sport fishermen, the, the hanging and, and construction of monofilament gill nets became popular among inshore gill netters. They were very, very efficient. The trouble is, if not used properly, they caught birds and mam excuse me, mammals and all kinds of other things. Now, there was an enormous brouhaha about this in the late, mid to late 80s. And even though um, it was demonstrated, you know, gill nets are like a tool, are a tool like a hammer, like anything else, used properly extremely efficient, used improperly, and they were by some people. You can catch birds and mammals and this and that. It all depends on how you use it. But in long story short, there was an assemblywoman in California who tried twice to pass legislation outlawing gill nets, and then with the support of the sport fishing lobby and a, and a strident environmental lobby, took it to a voter initiative, and in the early 1990s, gill nets uh, were banned within three miles of the coast and with one, within one mile of any of the Channel Islands, the Northern Channel Islands. So what we have here is a monstrously helpful uh, technological breakthrough with disastrous political consequences. So it isn't always a, you know, a linear story about it gets better and better and better with technology. Sometimes technology, if you're not careful on the political front and on other fronts, can come back to bite you. And this has really been an unfortunate blow to the, uh, to the fishing industry because used properly, gill nets uh, are, a, are a fine tool and a discriminating tool because in fact, the mesh size is designed to let non-target catch go through and, and focus on the target catch like you see here, but uh, used indiscriminately, it can sow the seeds of political disaster. So let's move on to trapping. Let's talk about lobsters, like this one. It's my friend, fisherman Sam Shroud, with a, a Harbor and Seafood Festival lobster. Invite you all to come the second Saturday of October. I'll get that plug in. Um, but so let's talk about let's talk about lobsters for a second. So this is what this is a laugh fishing trap. This is an old style, 1930s, 1940s. Uh, even into the early 50s, typical lobster trap. This one's in a little bit of disrepair. These traps took a lot of TLC. 
You had to soak them uh, in the water for quite a while before opening day so they could bubble out all the air that was trapped in the wood. They had to be, you know, so lobsters were not fond of crawling into traps that had, you know, were still bubbling. Uh, they had to cure, basically. They were made of wood, so they had to be rebuilt and repaired all the time, constantly. And uh, there's a, uh, I have a, a description of how we went from uh, uh, these lath traps, how we moved forward from, from the lath traps, but I wanted to, to read to you um, the beginnings of, I'm sorry, I, get my, I keep getting my page numbers and my slide numbers mixed up. Um, here we go. I wanted to read to you one of my favorite uh, parts of this, of this book. It has to do with these, with these la uh, laugh traps and how they were used, especially at the island lobster camps. This is a, a sub, uh, subhead called Island Lobster Camps, the Wild Wild West. And it's got a, the picture of the laugh trap on the opposite page. That's why I chose this passage. Lobster camps, those clusters of small canvas or wood carved shanties in their cooking and fish handling facilities, flourished at Anacapa and Santa Cruz Islands from 1900 to 1940. They were unique both for their isolation and for the breed of fishermen they, they attracted, men drawn to a solitary survivalist lifestyle. Some went because they knew it had an uncontrollable thirst for alcohol or an uncontrollable temper. Some were undoubtedly hiding from a criminal past, and some tried to hide from themselves in some terrible mistake of earlier life. Some, really the best of them, were the last of the old sailing ship men who, outli who had outlived their occupation. These men, mostly singled or widowed, remind us of the fact that the Wild West, the Gold Rush, and the Mountain Man era had expired but a few decades earlier. But unlike mountain men, there was no end game for mo this mostly rough and tumble crowd, sometimes lawless, with no dream of stockpiling earnings or striking it rich and settling it down, settling down. Most died in their boats or in their bunks, victims of everything from gangrenous fishing-related wounds to landslides, alcohol abuse, or gunshot wounds. Some were brought to the mainland for their final days, or in some cases, their final moments. But no matter how crude, competitive, ill-spirited, or downright combative they may have been, the island camp lobstermen were, were part of a tight-knit fraternal order. And I just got to read you the names of some of these guys. You will not believe it. And these are the guys that were in the laugh trap business all the way up until the 1940s. And the laugh, the laugh trap itself actually went into the 1950s. Christian Charlie Gunderson, Shorty Larson, Big Jerry Shively, Axel Big Swede Swanson. There's, there's more. Um, Frank Wild Horse Hansen, William Dutch Soltz, Kangaroo Fred Haggins, Little, Little Danny, Honest Ben, Hard Working Tom, love that one, were but a few of the men who helped color the era, and as sure as lobster was the camper's target catch, whiskey and pistols were their social currency. So this was a tough breed, and they were working with with uh, fairly rudimentary gear. Uh, Lark the Larco company would come out and resupply them. These folks were in basically indentured. Uh, they would sell their catch to the Larcos, and the Larcos would bring them their, their whiskey and pistols and guns and food and all, and, you know, all of that stuff, but uh, basically lived a solitary life, and they lived and died on the islands for most of them. Frenchie's Cove, actually, at Anacap Island, is named after one of these gentlemen. Frenchie Ledoux, I believe, was his last name. And by the 1950s, boom, we've got wire traps. These traps take less care, can be made more quickly, and, and uh, essentially you can fish a longer string with less manpower and quicker turnarounds with greater catch, more income, and, sust and uh, sustain your, your business uh, more easily. So under a heading that says, who invented the wire trap I've written, like most advances, wire traps came about more as a development than an invention or a discovery. See, that's one of the themes I'm trying to get across here, that these developments occurred from a range of variables. As I've mentioned, a, fab work of, of, a fabric of variables, people spying on each other, people having you know, genuinely individual ideas, people communicating, people borrowing from other cultures and other places. And sure enough, in the 1950s, we get wire traps that we see today. 
was, it, was more, uh, it was more of a development than an invention or discovery. Though not adopted in Santa Barbara until the mid-1950s, some Southern, Southern California fishermen were using box-like rectangular trips long before that, possibly as early as 1935. So here we have development as a function of, or lack of a function of, communication, right? There were, there were guys using wire traps in Southern California in the 1930s, certainly in the 1940s, while we were still using lath traps in Santa Barbara, only because the fishermen here flat out didn't know about it. So many credit Albert McGee or Lloyd Linois with developing the wire trap in Santa Barbara. Sonny Castagnola, however, tells a different story. It was Vince Roberti, having a hard time handling three things here. It was Vince Roberti, he was running the 25 foot sand crab and he, was, <clears throat> he kept bringing in far more lobsters than anybody else. Finally, somebody went down to Summerlin and pulled his gear. So there's another layer of the fabric, larceny. <laughs> People weren't shy of going, stealing ideas, stealing gear, still doing whatever they had to benefit themselves and in the process, it's sort of a dialectical notion for the philosophers among you. History moved forward, invention moved forward, and technology moved forward. Sure enough, he was using a wire trap, and within weeks, nearly all of Santa Barbara lobster, uh, lobstermen switched to wire traps. This picture was taken in the 1950s or early 60s, and uh, wire traps are the order of the day today. In fact, this is what a typical fisherman, my good friend Chris Miller, this is Chris with his wired gear. It can be bent on machines, it can be made fast, it can be made you know, in, in, in great quantities. Uh, the buoys have changed, they used to be made out of beveled um, the pieces of, of wood, floating wood, so the kelp would slough off, and now they use bullet-shaped, uh, you know, uh, uh, space-age uh, 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 styrene, poly kind of material. And that's what, that's what the modern traps look like. So you can run, they're actually having a big debate as part of the uh, lobster fishery management plan about limiting the number of traps. There are guys on the coast that use up to 900 traps, not here. But there are some folks who use it. Most of the guys around here run strings of like 300 plus. But uh, again, there's a function of a technological advance. When you, can, when you can get that many traps, and they still have to be dipped and cured, you know, in kind of an asphaltum material. But when you can make that many traps and, 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 and stack them and bait them without worry about them falling apart in the sea or breaking up, unless there's a huge south swell or something, you're going you're gonna to make a lot more money you're going to be able to set a lot more gear, and you're going to be able to turn the gear much more quickly because along with the invention of these traps, the development of these traps, you got to remember, at least I remember, and, and for those of you who don't know, came the, uh, the, the development of small, fast lobster boats and more and better uh, hauling equipment with davits that swung out from the boat and, uh, and blocks uh, that you could use to run the line in so you could... You could, you could pull the gear faster and move through your, your trap string faster. They all went together, and, and as a result, we have a huge lobster fishery in our town now, and thankfully the resource is highly sustainable. In case you can't tell, we've moved to harpoons. So, in the old days, um, this is what a harpoon swordfish plank looked like. For those of you who aren't familiar with harpoon uh, sword fishing, what you have to do, you can't just run up on the fish with a boat to harpoon it. Um, you sit in the crow's nest and you look for what's called a finner. This finner is about to die, by the way. Um, and, and you go out on the end of a plank, because you get the boat near a fish, it's gonna, it's gonna what they say, blow up. It's just gonna swim away. But if you're 30, 32 feet out in front of a, uh, the boat on a plank like this, you have an advantage and you're going to be able to harpoon the fish like this. And then it's kind of a, a whaling kind of thing. It takes out all the line and with a keg or a buoy or even a small skiff. It, it, it's all in the book here. It tells about that. But what I want to focus on and look at here is look how scary that is. I mean, can you imagine? This is actually an advanced one made by probably six inch wide planking. The original ones, as you'll hear in a passage in a moment, were made out of telephone poles playing down. 
with, with these cables that would stretch and pull and it would get wobbly. I mean, this to me, I mean, I was lucky to fish in an era where it was more sophisticated plank that I'll show you. This to me looks frightening as hell. I can't imagine being 32 feet out in the front of a boat with that kind of, all just that cabling holding me up. But they did it. And here's a passage related to that. By the 1930s, Santa Barbara harpooners were already modifying their gear to increase the chance of capturing swordfish they saw. I mean, they're just trying to catch them. They're just trying to figure out how to catch the things. The first innovation was the plank. A scaffold-like 20 to 30 foot wooden extension from the bow that allowed a harpooner to strike his prey before the boat scared it away. Amador Maceta, father of Santa Barbara fisherman Vince Maceta, was one of the first to build a plank, fitting it aboard his boat, the El Diablo. It's fairly simple and quite heavy, Maceta said. It was made from a telephone pole with one side planed down so the harpooner could walk on it. Alternate versions included 12, two by 12 inch boards, which may be what this is, that ultimately proved too fragile and were replaced by four by four inch planks or even beefier seven by 10 inch versions. At the end of the plank sat the pulpit, made of tubular pipe and built with a short horizontal bar near its base. This gave the harpooner a toehold that allowed him extra impetus when throwing the spear while keeping him from flinging himself overboard in the process. So this is hairy business. And I can tell you, even in the advanced uh, uh, plank technology, it was hairy business. There are a lot of stories in here about you know, the fish getting angry and, and coming back on the boat and driving their bill through it and what have you. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is this is the very first way that folks decided they could actually harpoon and swordfish, OK? It was this, this arrangement here couldn't be raised, couldn't be lowered. This was part of the boat. So think about it going up swell in rough weather. Say the weather comes up, you're coming back to Santa Barbara, and, the, and it gets tough. There's no, there's no um, uh, changing the, the angle of this plank. Like most of you have seen swordfish planks in the harbor, have seen them up in the air. That wasn't the case here early on. Many a plank were torn right off the boat because of that. Can you imagine what that would be like? The plank's torn off, the cable, and all the, the cable and the rigging's flying all over hell. You, you're worried about it, you know, especially if you're out on the end of the plank and you go through a swell, because that's happened too, where the plank gets ripped off with somebody out there on it. But we're going to see a change here. The swordfish plank comes of age. By the mid-1960s, this is like 30 years after the first planks were developed, Sword fishermen had tired of the rigid plank and were experimenting with alternate designs like planks with overlapping retractable boards that could be shortened in rough weather. A great leap forward was near. And, and I found that interesting that fishermen thought for years and years and years, how in the hell are we going to get past this rigid plank into something that's more sea friendly, that we can operate better, and, and this, to me, was a, a fantastic, this really, literally, was a breakthrough as opposed to something that was more evolutionary, though the thought process clearly was evolutionary. People have been putting their minds around this for decades. Though most technological breakthroughs, I apologize, I'm citing what I already wrote here, uh, are evolutionary works for which many deserve credit. To Bobby Hitt goes the title, the inventor of the structural plank. Gone by 1968 were the long, rigid, was the long, rigid board and the Rube Goldberg system of cables and turnbuckles. Re replacing them was a hit-designed plank whose walking board was surrounded by a framework of rigid sides that ma made of lightweight steel tubing. He first tried fiberglass po pole vault poles, but they were too wobbly. Most important, the plank could, via a system of concentric slider pipes, be retracted to an upright position in rough weather or in port. Hit's plank could even be lowered to a midpoint or a rough weather position. Angled high off the water, this position allowed for travel or even harpooning in choppy seas. That was unheard of with the other, with the rigid plank. The structural plank revolutionized the harpoon fishery, declared Fred Hepp, whose wife Gloria, I believe I saw here tonight, who probably put up with the construction of 150 or 200 planks in the front yard. Um, 
whose passion for fishing was self-taught talent for and self-taught talent for designing and welding planks led him to fashion 30 to 40 of the platforms per year for fishermen in the early 1970s. They gave the ability to travel at sea or move around the harbor easier. Plus, since they were retractable, guys made them even longer, up to 35 feet. In the 1980s, Hep built planks out of aluminum tubing as fishermen began favoring this material for its weight, which is more than a third lighter than steel conduit. So if you're not getting the visual, let me see if I can help you. So these, these pipes, these aluminum pipes or, or steel conduit in the early days, actually had concentric pipes. There would be one of a smaller diameter and one of a larger diameter. And as you cranked on the, the boom winch, which attaches to the plank up here, not easy to see, but it attaches to the plank up there, you raise the plank and one set of tubes is actually going through the other set of tubes. So it becomes quite easy to raise it up. And then when it gets to a certain position, a hole drilled in the outer conduit and a hole drilled in the inner conduit match up. And you put a pin in there and, you're, and tighten up a little bit on the boom winch and you're good to go. You can stay in port, you can travel with it up like that. Some guys, I used to even fish albacore with my plank on the boat in case you saw a finner while you're out fishing tuna. This was a monstrous breakthrough and revolutionized the swordfish uh, plank fleet. Hook and line. This is a modern day version of what successful hook and lining of rock cod looks like. You can see there's a, a hydraulically driven spool. It's high tech monofilament gear. It's really, really sophisticated. And the guy who, whose boat this is, who took this picture, is arguably the best uh, hook and line rock cod fisherman on the coast. His name is Tim Athens, a longtime friend of mine. But I want to read to you a passage about the early days because it wasn't always like this. So let's go back in time uh, to see what it was like in the early days, in the 1930s, when they were pulling this gear. This really uh, impressed me. Under the sub subhead of doing it the old fashioned way. From Santa Barbara fisherman Red Allen, excuse me, former Santa Barbara fisherman Red Allen, God rest his soul, loved the man, recalled hand lining rockfish aboard a 36 footer with his father, Vince Coolgis after his family moved from Avila Beach to Santa Barbara in 1935. At the time, seven rock cotters hailed from Santa Barbara. We had, a, we had no fathometer back then, so we'd motor along dragging weight until it hit a rock pile or got snagged. Then we'd start fishing. Usually we caught red rock cod and could fill up the boat with two and a half tons in a day or two, weather permitting. Now think about that. All you, the way you found the reef, which you dragged rocks along the bottom until they got snagged. I mean, like, really? Like you're out there in that ocean and you're driving, driving, dragging rocks along the bottom to, uh, to, to find your catch? There's more. Like most of their competitors, Coolgis and Allen pulled rockfish by hand. No small feat considering the gear sported up to 200 hooks and was weighted with webbing-bound rocks taken from local creeks and beaches. Now, let me tell you something. If you ever dropped a, 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 a river rock in the ocean and seen how long it takes to go down, the things are porous. They don't go straight down like a, like a, like a sash weight or a chunk of iron or, or something like that. So they're, so they're hit and miss with their weights already. And, and once this drifted down to the bottom, it, uh, he says this of hauling the hook, uh, hauling the, uh, the gear. We pull with the swells, Alan described, reaching out to grasp an imaginary main line. When, we, when a swell lifted the boat and brought the line tight, we'd stop. When the boat came down and provided some slack, we'd pull a few feet of line, and we kept this up until the fish came aboard. Over and over and over again. I fished rock cod. I fished it with, with uh, a hydraulic Ford rear end, which I'm going to get to here in a second. Um, and that's part of a whole another sort of breakthrough. But um, imagining pulling these fish by hand from five to 600 feet down, weighted, is, is, is beyond belief. The only way, like he said, you could do it was to let the swell do the work for you because it would be unbearably difficult. So I wanted to read to you, before we get into the diving, I wanted to read to you a passage um, about 
how this kind of gear turned, how, how we began to go from what I just described to this gear with many iterations in between. Eventually, hand pulling, like I just described, gave way to mechanical pullers driven by a car or truck gearboxes, which in turn were driven by line shafts connected to belts, connected by belts to the boat's main engine. Remember the Gertie head? Same application. Figuring I actually fished a boat here that had a four rear end axle uh, that turned a shiv. I, that's what I started with before I went to hydraulics. That boat was built in 1947. By the 1960s, fishery expanded, hydraulics, rod and reel gear, and the electric line haulers replaced mechanical pullers. Even bait was changing from sardines to squid and salt and mackerel and bonita. But here's a story about the um, um, mechanics and steps and iterations that fishermen went to, through while they were getting to what we would call modern time uh, uh, rock and uh, rock cod gear. In a burst of creativity, and that may be an exaggeration because there was a lot of trial and error. In a burst of creativity, fishermen used all kinds of weird hauling devices. One Santa Barbara boat sported a hydraulically powered forward rear end that turned vertically with a skinny shiv on top to pull rock cod lines, that'd be me. Craig Barbary, skipper of the Sunshine Lady, started with a geared bicycle-like pedal affair that he turned with his arms to pull lines through a stubby device resembling a mutant fishing pole. I remember going by the guy, you know, at sea, and there he'd be. He'd be like this, like an exercise bike in, an ex in a gym. Uh, other fishermen, like Phil Schenk, who hook and line rock cod for years out of Santa Barbara beginning in the early 1980s, Stuck with rod and reel gear, sending crewmen to the rail to crank up fish with 12 odd or 14 odd pin reels. Uh, the setups also included rail boards where he'd lay it on the rail, etc. But Phil has another interesting comment here that I just love. One of the good things about rod and reeling was that it was fast, said Phil. If you missed a spot or you hit a spot where the fish weren't biting, you could get the gear back on the boat and be underway for a new spot more quickly than you could with buoy line gear. That's, this is buoy line gear, where you set all the gear and attach it to a buoy and wait for the fish to commit suicide. Trouble is, rod and reel gear is hard on the body. When I finally switched to buoy lining, my right arm was an inch bigger than my left and my shoulders weren't straight. I looked like all screwed up like a boxer who passed his prime. So, any way you slice it, this was hard work. I remember rock cutting every night, having to either put bag balm or even butter or, or body lotion on my hands because these fish are so rough on your, on, to handle that they will, li they will literally you know, scrape the skin off your hands. And in the morning, and fisher can re fishermen can relate to much tougher times than this, you literally had to stick your hands down into the salt water by the side of the boat, or if you had a bait tank, into the bait tank in order to uh, open them up because they would just close with all the salt and, and little wounds and what have you. But you can see, I hope, the steps between the hauling of gear by hand, which unfortunately I wish I had a picture of, but none that I could find, and this. This is absolutely current modern, and in between you had guys with, with forward rear ends, um, bicycle frames, and every other manner of pulling gear from the bottom in the iterative steps between hauling by hand and hydraulic high-tech monofilament uh, line fishing for rock cod. Sorry, I did it again. So diving. <laughs> After the era of the Chinese, which is described in the book, um, and, and, and where they would go along in very small boat with what's called a look box on the end of a pole to um, see the abalone with. It was really a, just a, a glass box that magnified what they were looking at. And they had a little device on the end of a pole, some kind of a blade where they would pop the abalone off. The Chinese weren't divers. They were followed by the Japanese. And in the 1940s, late 1940s, or mid 40s actually, and even before the internment of the Japanese, this picture was taken in 1938. Um, we had hard hat divers uh, experimenting with really, really uh, uh, 
advanced gear for the time, and, and I know Greg has had, had a whole um, series on hard hat diving. Some of the greatest hard hat divers uh, of our, our era have uh, born and raised and lived around here and uh, can tell stories going from here to tomorrow about the hard hat diving. And this was done with you know a compressor. The first compressors were actually operated by shore, by hand, if you can imagine you know how risky that is, with a hard hat and a full diving suit. Uh, you know, like some had wool underneath them, a lot were rubber. But this is a, this is typical hard hat diving gear. One of the advantages of hard hat diving gear was that you could walk along the bottom uh, with these big leaded shoes and just walk along picking up abalone. Well, that's when we had virgin stocks. And for the record, there's a difference between virgin stocks and sustainable stocks. Virgin stocks are untouched stocks. Sustainable stocks uh, are stocks that are fished. Uh, at levels of sustainability. Well, you can keep on fishing them, but they are distinctly different than a virgin stock. A virgin stock is, is jumping in, and oh my God, there they are everywhere. I'm in the mother lobe. That, uh, that was the case uh, back in the early hard hat diving days. But after a while, wetsuits replaced hard hat gear. Why? We're gonna, I'm gonna tell you right here if I can get the right page. I'm going to go back to a passage about the hard hat diving. This was during an interview with Steve Ferris, a good friend of mine whose father, Sam Ferris, was also a good friend of mine who many of you may remember. And this is what he said about being a tender on a hard hat dive boat. He's speaking of the two other di the two divers on the boat. He was the tender. They'd split dive, Steve said. One would, would dive in the morning. The other would dive in the afternoon. It took about 15 minutes to dress in the diver with suit, helmet, weights and shoes, plus, plus rubbing his face with Joy soap to prevent fogging uh, in the mask. Joy replaced the old style method of swabbing a moist stack of Bull Durham tobacco on the glass. Then we'd set the ladder down and put him over, to the, over the side. I mean, that's pretty rudimentary. In fact, it's kind of gnarly. Um, Ferris recalled, as he walked, my job was to cut kelp so he stayed on his bubbles and, not, and did not not impede his progress. Every so often he'd stop and say, give me a line. Hard hatters enjoyed telephone communications with the boat, a benefit lost in the wetsuit era. I'd drop rope with an empty bag, he'd take the bag, snap on the full bag of abs for me to lift, then continue walking. A good tender, a diver say, could toss an empty, excuse me, could toss an empty bag up current just as the right at the right spot so it would land directly on the on the harvester below. Tending wasn't easy work. Picture this, Ferris said. It's sunny, hot day. You're working in the lee of Santa Cruz Island. Ted's walking like hell, really hoofing it. He's referring to Ted Benton, a famous uh, abalone diver from Santa Barbara who has crossed the bar. Um, he's really hoofing it. He's been down for three hours. Three hours. Can you imagine that in shallow water? It's just unbelievable. The kelp's getting thicker as Ted walks short towards shallow water in order to keep from getting bent. At noon, Ted would take over and we'd do the same thing for three more hours. At night, Ferris recalled, the crew relaxed hard over tall glasses of Thunderbird wine and grapefruit juice. <laughs> so it was a tough time. It was a time for tough people. But again, the work ethic was really, really solid. It's some would argue that the work ethic then was greater than the work ethic we typically see among people, uh, uh, American youth and even American adults today. Final slide. So obviously, there are no, there's no hard hat diving going on these days. Um, but that being said, how did we go from hard hat to wetsuit? Did it just happen? Was it out of need, was it necessity? Well, in this case, there was an environmental impetus to the technological change. And I'm reading from my good friend, uh, Jimmy Finch. Uh, and Jimmy says, the gear, longtime gear, excuse me, the, the wetsuit gear was suited to a time when abalones were getting harder to find. Hard hat gear was fine when the abs were so plentiful you'd see them out in the open, he noted but swim gear allowed you to get underneath rocks and inside caves and crevices. I tried hard hat gear, but I felt a lot more efficient swimming. 
So why did they switch from hard hat gear to, to, uh, to uh, what they call swim gear, the wetsuit gear, which is obviously the primary gear used to take our most, our largest catch in Santa Barbara by volume every year on sea urchins. Basically, it was the ability, you lost the ability to walk on the bottom, but you, but you regained the ability to swim and look under cracks and crevices and in holes and caves and what have you, and to find the critters wherever they lived. And so that was the trade-off. It was one made of environmental necessity, you could call it, or uh, uh, a fisheries necessity. But again, virgin stocks and sustainable stocks are two different things. And this is the way they've done it then. This is the way they do it today. And I'm happy to say this is a highly sustainable fishery and is the number one fishery in Santa Barbara and remains so. So that pretty much concludes what I have to say. I know it was a little hit and miss. I hope you understand the theme I was trying to get across of these technological advances. Um, sometimes seem herky-jerky, sometimes they were, but oftentimes there were a whole, there were a lot of layers of input over time that went into these advances and they didn't just happen one over the other overnight. And with that, uh, I would, I would com uh, conclude my talk, and I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions if I can. And thankfully, there are fishermen here like Mike McCorkle to help me if I fail. But happy to answer any questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, with, with these techn technological advances, is there any concern, like in the case of the rock cod, about diminishing the supply out there? That's a great question. You know, along with the technological advances, has been a huge leap forward in, in fisheries management, fisheries science, and, and regulatory, um, the regulatory structure, if you will. And so thankfully, that's kept pace or even outpaced the technological advance. So uh, I would argue that we have some of the most conservatively managed fisheries in the world. We're not fishing anything out. All the fisheries you see here in Santa Barbara are sustainable. Yeah. And actually, there's a whole thread in this book, too, about re regulations dating back a century. A lot of folks are under the misunderstanding that we live in the environmentally aware era. And we all were born into it in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. The fact of the matter is, scientists were, scientists were concerned about the sustainability of these stocks 80, 90, 100 years ago. They were just working with data poor fisheries. But they, they were doing all kinds of things to try and make sure that they didn't make a mistake and fish, fish uh, certain uh, species out. Yes, sir. You know, it's funny you mention that. There have been a lot, dozens, you know, and I, I don't have an exact, I, I apologize, thank you, Greg. The question was, um, do I have a handle on how many fishermen have lost their lives at sea given the fact this is a dangerous occupation? Yes, locally. Was that the question, sir? Yeah, locally. Locally here. And the answer is dozens. I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on it, maybe Mike has an idea. You know, we wrestled with this concept about Eight years ago, when we established the Lost at Sea Memorial out at the end of the breakwater, we were going to do a, a ton of research and try and actually put names up there. But we realized what a disaster it would be if we forgot somebody and we had to be reminded by the family. That we'd, so what we did was we made it generic. But I, I think the number is easily in the dozens, if not well over 100. Mike, do you have any thought on that? How many fishermen have been lost out here, uh, local fishermen? But, he's, but how about lost at sea, died at sea? How, how about died at sea, lost their sea in this dangerous uh, industry? How many locally lost at sea? Lost their lives. Lost their lives. In, in what period? Ten years. The last 10 years. Yeah, last 10 years, half a dozen, dozens and dozens over the years. I fished in the 70s and I saw I mean, I can name names, you know, but I saw it's been dozens. It is a dangerous, dangerous racket. Yes, sir. How about the testing of seafood deaths? Has anybody ever tested the lobster here in Santa Barbara that are caught near shore for uh, contaminants? Or the question is, has anybody ever tested lobsters caught near shore for pollutants and contaminants? And I believe the answer is yes, absolutely, because there is a shellfish 
uh, toxin protocol and testing program up and down the coast, especially for, um, uh, oh, what's that toxin? Um, Demoic acid, thank you, and the toxin that creates paralytic shellfish poisoning. So yeah, shellfish are periodically tested up and down the coast, whether they're bivalves or lobster or what have you. Lobsters are pretty darn safe, usually. Yeah. I just learned today that you shouldn't eat cabazon eggs, by the way, for all those of you who catch your own cabazons, they're poisonous. Just the eggs. Ma'am, you had a question? No, no, ma'am. The question was, did the castagnolas make their own line? No, they didn't make their own line, but they built their own nets out of the line, which had to be cured in the tannin and dried on the racks and then re-soaked in the ocean. Quite a process from, from just buying nylon net at the store and putting on your, on your net. Anyway. Not that that's easy. There's a lot of mending still with all of that. Uh, you in the back. <laughs> You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, the, I apologize. The question was, do we have any forecasts relative to upcoming technologies and what have you? You know, I think folks are always out there thinking about this, and I really appreciate the question because the trends we talked about for the last 45 minutes or however long it was um, are always being, you know, modified and, and we're always moving forward. I know in the sport fishing world, They've made all kinds of changes in the last number of years in order to uh, trick fish or you know, catch squid to, in order to catch sea bass, or they've learned that. Let me give you an example of, and I'm a little off topic here, but I want to give you an example. I've been, I've been involved in fisheries politics for 40, 35 years, and it's always, I've heard a lot of folks with a lot of letters behind their name who claim to be the real fisheries scientists, but I can tell you, and this relates to your question, of, of, of technology in advance, who the real scientists in the room are guys like Mike. Okay, and I don't mean to embarrass Mike, but if you think about what really is science, it's re repeated experiments under variable conditions to try and find, to try and, and exact the outcome you're looking for. Think about history, think about the development of the electric motor and all, and all and if you watched Cosmos, you know, that, that series with Neil deGrasse Tyson, Fishermen, there's a reason that they know that they can catch white sea bass in 30 in 63 degree green water in the middle of June, three miles off the Ventura County coast, on an uphill on an uphill current with a quarter moon. Why? Because they tried it every other damn way they possibly could, and they figured out that that's how technology and knowledge in itself advances. And it's always broken my heart that fishermen aren't respected for that kind of knowledge because scientists write it off as anecdotal. It's not anecdotal, it's empirical. So I'll get off my soapbox now on that. In terms of the future, I will I always anticipate new things and new the spectral line, the braided line that fishermen, you know, that sport fishermen use. How long's that been here? Six, seven years is all? So there's always stuff to look forward to and, and it'll always be done within the, the box of sustainability. That's what I think we can take the most uh, most pleasure in. Most confident. Yes, sir. Uh, what different types of farming is going on in the Santa Barbara area? I'm sorry. What types of what? Farming. Farming. The question was, what type of what types of, of farming are going on in the Santa Barbara area? Primarily abalone. Okay, abalone you can't take south of San Francisco since 1996, but there are at least two abalone ranches or abalone farms where they're being raised in our region. Other than that, there's, a, there's been an ongoing white sea bass um, uh, repopulation. Of course, that's a whole other political thing. I don't, never thought they were depopulated. But anyway, a white sea bass enhancement program since 1983 uh, going on where uh, white sea bass or little ones are reared in pens. You may have seen it right off Stern's Wharf occasionally, and they do releases uh, of those. But those are the only two I can think of. The rest is still the natural world. And now that you brought it up, I got, a, I got a point I just cannot not make. Um, and that is there is a difference. We all need to understand when it comes to fisheries, there's a difference between abundance and availability. I ran sport fishing party boats for years down at Channel Islands Harbor. I ran the Sea Angler, the China Clipper, the Estrella, the Coral Loma, the Gentleman. And I caught one white sea bass in that entire time. 
And one, and somebody, not that I'm that crappy, but you know, there are probably better fishermen than me, but you know, I, I took 40, 50, 60 people to sea every day. And why did we catch no sea bass? Was it because there were no sea bass? No, they were somewhere else. It was a difference between abundance and availability. White sea bass stocks are healthy. I bet you there's a bunch of people in this room who caught white sea bass in the last few years. They're like, you know, they're, they're thick. The Ranger 85 limited on them a couple of days ago. So always something to keep in mind when you look at landings. The landings are down. Oh my God, the fishery's in trouble. Not necessarily. There's a whole lot of stuff to think about when we look at that. A lot of layers. Yes, sir. You got a year or two we could talk? No, I'm joking. The question was, there, are, there, are, there, is a network, there is a network of marine protected areas along the coast now where you can't fish. And that was developed as a function of a law called the Marine, the Marine, help me Mike, the Marine, huh? The Marine Life Protection Act, thank you very much. Passed in 1999 and folks like Mike and myself, they convened a stakeholder group of 64 people representing all uh, interests, and the idea was not so much that certain fisheries were in trouble and could be restored this way. The idea was sort of twofold, that if we set aside these areas where no fishing is allowed, right, it will do a, a couple of things. Number one, it'll set aside wilderness areas, sort of a Teddy Roosevelt concept, areas that we just know in the human soul that we're not touching, and that's just good for everything that lives there and good for human beings to just know that, very much like our national forest. The other idea was that animals who live there will repopulate to the boundaries external to those marine protected areas. This is a notion that's highly controversial and, and debated by many, many folks because you wonder, well, the fishermen have pushed out of there and what's called you know, the, the externalities. What are the external consequences of that when they have to fish over it? Very complex stuff. But, but it, the short answer is no, it wasn't specifically designed to rebuild uh, depleted fisheries. Because we really, you know, really don't have any uh, depleted fisheries around here right now. There's a lot of regulations to prevent that. One more question. Yeah, Jack. <coughs> The question was, what are our landing figures here in Santa Barbara compared to the old days? Well, the answer is they're less. But they're not less because the fishing's worse, they're less because the fleet is smaller. Um, owing to a, a really uh, conservative uh, regulatory regime and some of the old fishermen retiring out of the business, it's, it's really, it's almost Darwinian, Jack. It's selected for the smartest, brightest, most able fishermen are the ones that are out there making a living, primarily urchins, lobsters, sea bass, and our day trawlers who fish for sea cucumbers, shrimp, and halibut. But that being said, our landings last year were the highest they've been in 10 years. The value was the, the highest it's been in 10 years. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing the introduction of like the black cod fishery. They've opened up the black cod fishery south of Point Conception. So by landings and values, we, 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 we land about seven million pounds of fish a year here in Santa Barbara, worth X vessel, excuse me, X vessel means the money paid to the fishermen, worth about um, uh, 10, a little over $10 million, and using variable uh, extrapolated uh, multipliers, 
uh, that's pretty much somewhere between a, a 28 and, and $35 million a year economic benefit to our community. 